sometimes I don't even watch the things I've been in. I do watch it to be practical, to see what I can do better, or you know, just to see if, I, if I'm having the right effect on the audience. I don't ever watch myself like a fan and say, yes, you were awesome in that scene, buddy. <laughs> American Body Shop. The character Rob, an American Body Shop was my first leading role on a TV show. It was a pretty inconsequential show on Comedy Central, but um, it was an exciting big deal for me. I had auditioned for so many series and, and you know, come very close to like getting them and never got them. Oh. Look at that, he's on fire! He's on fire! He's on fire! Rob was easily the best part on the show. It was sort of mockumentary. It was pretty broadly comic. I just remember I had an unexplained bald spot that I was really excited about. Good news, another undercarriage road test. We came up with it when we were like cooking up our looks. All the other guys were, did the like normal frat guy thing where they were like, oh, well, I should, I should roll up my sleeves and have like cool hair, like Danny Zuko. And I was like, I want to have a weird bald spot and always have some mad scientist glasses and like a weird handlebar mustache and be filthy. <laughs> Children's Hospital. I did a movie with Rob Corddry in the uh, early 2000s, I guess. And we had a blast. He was the white <laughs> mayor of this town and I was his sheriff. And we had a lot of fun and we kind of hit it off. And then shortly after that, he wrote Children's Hospital and he sent it to me and I loved it. And I thought it was so funny. And he also said they had the idea to cast my wife, Megan Mullally in the role of chief. And we both just thought it was the funniest thing we had seen and were desperate to, to do it. Megan got to do it. I unfortunately got sidelined with this other show called Parks and Recreation which totally ruined my children's hospital career. So I was supposed to be a regular on children's hospital in the role of Chance Briggs, but after some negotiation, NBC agreed to let me do like one or two per season. So I got to still do a handful of them. The reason so many funny people were on that show is because it was so fun to work on. It was completely filthy and irreverent. There were no rules. You were required to be as stupid as possible. Hey, when's the last time you had your prostate checked? I don't have time for that kind of thing. Um, do you have time for cancer? Get in here. No, you get in here. We loved working on it. It, it was really fun. It felt like we were getting away with something. <laughs> Parks and Recreation. Parks and Recreation. Is that the one with Star-Lord? I was a big fan of The Office. I originally auditioned for the role of Michael Scott. Dave Koechner, who played Todd Packer, among other you know, legendary comedy roles, he and I auditioned the same day to play Michael Scott. So I was a huge fan of The Office. And I had known Rain Wilson for a long time, and I would say to Megan, we'd watch The Office, and I would say, you know what, if I'm ever gonna get like a big break, I think it's gonna be on a show like this, in a part like Dwight Schrute which is crazily exactly what happened. But they were creating Parks and Rec, and they had me in to read for a different part, who was a romantic interest for Rashida's character. And it went great, and, and everybody was very happy, and they sent the tape to NBC, and they said literally, this is a quote, Nick Offerman, you said someone like Aaron Eckhart, and you <laughs> send us this hog? I believe that was the term they used. So NBC said no to me as a love interest for Rashida. But then Mike Schur and Greg Daniels, the creators, said, shoot, we really like this guy and we want him on the show. Let's make him that part of Amy's boss that should be 20 years older than he is. And they called me and said they wanted me to do that. And NBC then made me audition for like five months. They looked at every other person in the world who could speak English. But Mike and Greg stuck to their guns and finally gave me the part. It was a libertarian who hated the government and that was the impetus of the, of the role. And you know, then together we added layers onto him. They made him a woodworker because I 
like Ron's wood shop on the show is my actual shop in real life. And the, his canoes, like I made those canoes and stuff like that. So, you know, I think with any character on a show that lasts, it's a collaboration between the writers and the actor to continue fleshing it out, coloring in between the lines as you go. You have two choices. One, get rid of Tammy. Or two, lobotomy and castration. Choose wisely. Stupid This is a waste of time. The mustache was one of the looks that I had had on stage. Like, I definitely favored a substantial mustache. That was the first thing we agreed upon, was that he would have a kick-ass mustache. The hairdo was sort of developed over the first season, but we called it the full douche. We thought it was really funny. And other than that, the Mike Schur and, and Greg Daniels said to me, to the whole cast, we want you guys to feel real. So if the show gets picked up, please don't start doing Pilates and lose a bunch of weight. And he specifically asked me to stay beefy. So I um, ate at least two cheeseburgers a day for seven years. The rest, as they say, is history. All good things. People were crazy about the documentary The Jinx, with good reason. The man who made it, Andrew Jarecki, before he made The Jinx, made a narrative feature of the same god story, starring Ryan Gosling as Robert Durst, Kirsten Dunst as his wife and murder victim, allegedly, and I was cast as her brother. And these are all real life people. And it was really good. I mean, it was a really good movie. Thank you, Ma, that's nice. I feel much better about oh. my life now. <laughs> Andrew Jarecki had put together an incredible packet of research. So there was video, there was interviews. I believe they asked me if I wanted to go meet the guy. And I didn't want to, I was freaked out. I think Christian Bale would be ashamed of me. Kirsten and I saw a screening of it in LA when it was done, and it was so good. And then at the end, Robert Durst is still living in like uh, Galveston, selling real estate. The movie made you so furious because this guy clearly was a f killer and he was walking free. We walked out of the screening and we were like, this movie sucks. Like, I hate this movie, because it doesn't end like that story. We know that story, like, oh. Then he went to jail. It's like, no, this guy is still, you can go see him. And we were really angry. So I was really happy that Andrew, I mean, what tenacity. He stuck with the story, made the jinx, won a bunch of trophies, and got Robert Durst to confess <laughs> on screen. X cop. A good friend of mine named Martin Garner, who is a guy who we've done some writing partnering. We had written some stuff together and he found the graphic novel of Axe Cop and brought it to my attention. And a couple other friends did too, like I guess because he had a mustache and he had sort of a deadpan delivery. We've got some bad guys to kill. I will chop your heads off. I knew, uh, people at, at Fox Animation, and, and I brought it to them, and, and so we ended up making a cartoon of it. I just thought it was so wickedly hilarious. Despite my involvement, I was surprised it wasn't a hit. It never really like took off as a huge animated hit, but the people who love it really love it. I mean, I think for some reason, people just didn't discover it, because it's really funny. I love doing voiceover stuff. It's a way to get to work on really funny writing, that you know doesn't have the limits of the physical world. So you can be stupid in so many more ways in a cartoon. I always seem to be cast as people who scream or, or somehow enter battle. And so I always end up just destroying my voice because you're not limited. You know, if you're fighting a dragon in real life, you can only do so many takes because of the budget. But in animated, work, you can kill the dragon all day long. So I, I always tend to lose my voice. So I've, l I've had to learn to be very careful so that I can go home and still speak to my wife. We're the Millers. We're the Millers. I played Don Fitzgerald and, and when that came to me, I just thought it was really funny. 
Jennifer Aniston is amazing, and Jason Sudeikis is really funny. And to be a comic duo with Katherine Hahn, who's just like a comedy tornado, was absolutely delightful. I choose things because I think the writing is good, and I thought that was a really funny script and seemed like a blast, which it turned out to be. That was, uh, that was upsetting. I, that required a lot of therapy on my part afterwards. I still get weird around people's ears. So I guess we're swinging. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> That's right. There they are. Wow. Donald, are you looking at this? I'm touching her boobs. <laughs> was that written in the script? I believe that was just something I did. The director may have suggested it. You know, you, you get in those situations and, and you just start playing around. I believe uh, ear intercourse was just one of those lucky inspirations. Probably the toughest thing was trying not to laugh at Jason Sudeikis. Like, especially in that tent scene, he really made me crack up. I pride myself on, on not breaking easily, but when I do, I, I go for it. The Lego movie. Our business wants everybody to be a specialist, you know? If your big break is playing a, a tennis champion, then nobody wants to see you in a movie about basketball. So we've talked about, you know, in my acting roles, I, I've tried not to get pigeonholed in Ron Swanson-esque roles, but when people cast you in an animated work, they're casting your voice and what you sound like, which I'm kind of fine with, but then that I sort of reached a limit where I was like, I can't, if I was an actor, I wouldn't do the, this exact same thing for every job. And so I was really grateful when Phil Lord and Chris Miller cast me as Metal Beard. And in our first session, we played around with what, what does this guy sound like? This weird sounding, you know, like Irish pirate robot. And I was so happy that I could do a funny voice and I would love to do all kinds of funny voices. And I know it's going to be really hard. Really but... hard? <laughs> Wiping ye bum with a hook for a hand is really hard. I think we're gonna do more Lego movie stuff. I suppose it all depends on how it's doing business-wise. But the last I heard, I thought there was more to come. So I'll, I'll be happy to, to do Metal Beard until they run out of ideas. Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. That film was great. It was a wonderful book. It was a wonderful script adapted by the, by the book writer. Uh, just across the board, it was a work of art. It was a beautiful thing to be a part of. The cast was great. We shot it in Pittsburgh, which is where it was set. And the young actors were astonishingly good. Frankly, they were annoying because the competence that they displayed at age, you know, 19 to like 23, I have not yet achieved, and I'll be 50 this year. So I despised them, and still do. You have not even unwrapped your college directory. Mom, don't go through my stuff. We discussed it, and she gets to go through your stuff. I've worked with, I mean, the occasional horse or donkey. I had not worked with a cat on film, and I would not recommend anyone work with a cat on film. Generally, on a film set, you end up having to shut off the air conditioner because it makes a noise, so rooms get uncomfortably warm. Cats don't like that And then if you hold them, and they're very hairy and warm in general, and you're creating like a furnace ball, they don't like that either. And they let you know that with their claws. I was amazed that they were able to edit together usable footage. I felt terrible because, you know, the, you're being told, like, hold that cat against its will so that we can photograph you together. <laughs> the founder. The producers had put together an incredible Bible of articles and interviews and there's tons of like video interviews with with these guys i think you have to ask the question from the get-go am i gonna go for like charlize as megan kelly in bombshell like am i am i gonna go for like total impersonation or not and so far for me it's been not 
because people don't know what the guy looks like. You know, it's not Teddy Roosevelt or something. And so what we did was glean everything we needed to about these characters to then fuel the story as we wanted to tell it. How the heck did you come up with this? Oh, I didn't. We did. Dick McDonald, my brother. Hi. Boy, I gotta tell you, this is the most... Well, it's nice to meet you. Working on that film with Michael Keaton, at first, that was, I think, the scariest circumstance I'd been in. My final scene in the movie is, is a very dramatic sort of face-off with him in a men's room. We shot it around Atlanta, and I'd gotten there like a week early to get acclimated and do costume fittings, and the d director said, hey, we're shooting at this country club. It's a scene with Michael and Laura Dern and a couple other actors. Come on by and say hi and whatever. And right when I got there, they said, the director said, oh, the men's room here is amazing. If you don't mind, I'd like to shoot your, your biggest scene in the movie that you're not at all prepared for this afternoon. Is that cool? And I was like, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> why wouldn't that be <laughs> cool, barf? And so I had to like whip it together. And that's the circumstances in which I met Michael Keaton. We showed you everything. The whole system, all our secrets. We were an open book. So why didn't you just steal it? Just grab your ideas and run off, start my own business using all those ideas. Yours would have failed. He was all business. Not very nice, you know, like don't meet your heroes and all that. And we rehearsed the scene a couple times. They're like, okay, let us, let the crew have the set. We'll get it all set up. So we have time to, we go sit in two chairs like this. And then Michael Keaton is like, hey man, so, like completely so friendly and nice. And what I realize is every day he shows up and he's all business until he gets it figured out. And then he's like, all right, let's talk about baseball or what, fishing or whatever. We became great buddies, but man, working with somebody like him, you see immediately why he's a huge movie star. He's great, he's talented, he's really hardworking, but he, he has this, he like shoots lightning bolts out of his eyeballs. So when you're doing a scene with him and he turns his focus on you, at least for me, I was like, oh my God, he's looking right at me. Oh my God, I have to talk here pretty soon. So I had to keep it together. Hearts Beat Loud. The role of Frank Fisher in Hearts Beat Loud was just a dream come true, of which I've, I now seem to have several, uh, which makes me feel so lucky that it keeps me minding my manners so that maybe I'll, I'll even get another one. I worked on a, a movie called The Hero, which is a beautiful film. This guy named Brett Haley made I'll See You In My Dreams, starring Blythe Danner, and then The Hero, starring Sam Elliott, and I was cast as his pot-dealing friend. And I just, this guy's movies are, are wonderful. He's a, such a great filmmaker, and he wrote his next movie for me called Hearts Beat Loud, and I it just was over the moon. I mean, it's the first time I got to be a leading man that was just like a normal guy, like, like there were shots of me walking down the street because the audience cares about how my day is going. And I was like, what, so I just walk and like feet, em emote? All right, roll, camera. I'm not even sure it means anything. Meaning, shmeaning. I want it that way. They want what, what way? Does, doesn't matter, hits Wait, on. I'm sorry, are you bringing up the Backstreet Boys in reference to my lyrics? All due respect, it's actually a pretty good song. Mm. Oh, come on. How did you get to be such a music snob? Blythe Danner plays my mom, Ted Danson, Tony Collette. I mean, it's crazy. But Kiersey Clements as my daughter is such a knockout talent. Like, when she started singing, <laughs> we, all, we all took a knee and said, our movie is going to be good. It was so gratifying to get to do that. The first day we met was in New York, and it was, I don't know, a week or two before we started shooting, we met to rehearse our band, to rehearse our music, because neither of us are like pro musicians. I wasn't even trying to like establish a rapport. 
It's just when, like, when your co-star, when your fellow actor arrives, whoever that may be, you're like, hey, hi. And so you already know that you're about to make this art project together in which you love each other and you go through like a journey together. You have some laughs, you have some tears. Then you meet her and you're like, hi, like we're, we're about to get to dance together or we're gonna play some amazing football together or whatever it is. So there's already a sort of uh, a fondness, a camaraderie. And then I, I just start uh, teasing her like messing with her, like one foundation of our relationship was me making fun of like my age where I, was, I started texting her emojis. I started trying like way too hard with my emoji game. Things like that where I was like, Kiersey, I don't know if you're up on uh, what's fresh or fire with the kids these days. And you know, and that would really annoy her. So we just immediately had like a dad daughter rapport. Like dad trying to be cool and be like, hey, what's up? You, do you, do you like house music? Because I'm down with that. Devs. I got a call that Alex Garland wanted to meet with me for a TV series, and I was a very big fan of his. I mean, I started crying a little bit when I got that call because it was like Stanley Kubrick or something where I was like, it was not in the realm of someone that might call. So that was it. I was like, yeah, whatever, count me in. But then I got the scripts and read them. I was like, <laughs> said to my wife, honey, I have a very good part in a very exquisite eight episode program. And you know, everything just piled on from there. He turned out to be an absolute dreamboat to work with. And when someone is as smart and talented as him and they're dreamy, then everybody else is dreamy because everybody wants to work with that and be around it. So all the crew and the heads of the departments, all the collaborators, the producers, the cast are just one after the other. They're, they're absolute astonishing thespian heroes. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to, to be among them. When I get a job, one of, my, one of the things I relish the most is like, okay, you got the job. Sometimes before even before the deal closes, I call the whoever the Alex is and say, okay, what whiskers can I have? What weird hairdo can I have? Can I shave my head in some sort of up way that will make my wife upset? I love to look strange and unrecognizable. So we talked back and forth and ultimately Alex uh, found a picture of a guy and the incredibly talented Nadia Stacy who did our hair and makeup. She won a BAFTA for the favorite, not a big deal. She then took the picture of this guy and like created it on me. It was my beard, but trimmed. So she took my crazy beard and made it different crazy and made me look like a ginger. And then I had a shaved head. So that was a wig with like baldness on top. What am I actually doing here? I'm not gonna tell you. Don't worry. You're gonna figure it out. I come from Chicago theater, and, and sometimes people hear that and they mistake it for Chicago comedy. And it's two very separate things. So I'm a straight theater actor. I'm not a trained comedy performer. I'm trained in like elocution and sword fighting. But when you do theater, you do whatever is on the season. And in any given theater season, you usually have a Shakespeare, a Tracy Letts drama, a comedy, so you sort of learn all the tools. I didn't aspire to work in comedy or drama or any genre per se. I just hope to work on as good of writing as possible. And so I'm kind of having my dream come true by getting to have a variety of things. I would, I would, would not want to be known as a, a comedy star or, or you know, a, only a tragedian. I'd rather be known as, as someone versatile who can get the job done.